Welcome to Digging for Truth, presented by the Associates for Biblical Research. I'm your host, Henry Smith. Today we'll be surveying one of the most controversial artifacts in history, the Shroud of Turin. Is the Shroud a fraud, or could it possibly be the burial shroud of Jesus of Nazareth? What is the historical and scientific evidence surrounding the Shroud? Well, today, Shroud researcher John Long joins me to help answer these questions and more. John, welcome to Digging for Truth. Thank you, Henry. Thank you for having me on. Well, John, it's great to have you on the program. We've, we've known each other for many years. I've been wanting to have you on the show to talk about the Shroud of Turin. So maybe you could begin by just telling people a little bit about yourself and why the Shroud has been an interest of yours for 40 years. Thank you, Henry. Well, um, I'm a college-educated uh, Christian. Uh, I uh, worked as a parole and probation officer and supervisor for many years. And for the past 40 years, I've been interested in the Shroud since I first heard about it in the early 1970s. It just seemed incredible that something like Jesus' actual burial shroud would have been preserved down through the centuries. But um, today, the Shroud has become the most intensively studied single artifact of all time. More uh, investigations have been poured into the Shroud than any other single uh, artifact, and I think that uh, much of it is, is pointed towards authenticity. Well, that's great. That's a great introduction. Okay, so there might be a few people out there that actually don't know what the Shroud is, so maybe we could start with, you know, it's like they say in football, gentlemen, this is a football. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what is the Shroud of Turin? Okay, well, um, what we will see on our screen is a um, is a picture of the shroud. Uh, the top register shows um, the shroud as you would see it normally. Um, you notice that there's a figure of a man uh, laying on his back on the right side and a figure of the of the man on his front side on the other half of it. Uh, there's two lines of uh, uh, scorches that um, uh, frame the uh, body image, and um, actually the, the image on the shroud does not look quite as uh, dark as what is, appears in, in this positive image. The shroud had been hidden away, had been seen by very many people over the centuries, was, was becoming um, popular in Europe or, or reaching lots of notoriety, but in, in 1898, the first photograph of it was taken, and there was a big surprise there. So although the image on the positive side looks um, difficult to see, when you see the photographic image, uh, or negative rather, um, there is a remarkably detailed image of the man who was buried in it uh, to be seen. And that's what's created most of the stir in the, tw in the 20th century up to now uh, about the shroud. Again, it's become the most intensively studied single artifact of all time, and um, and it seems to be the, the the perfect picture for for Easter. All right. Well, I think that's a that's a good introduction. Where I know people who are familiar are going to know about you know people claiming it's a fake and all that. And don't worry, folks, we're going to be getting into that a little later. But here we just want to talk a little bit about the question of. It, can this, at minimum, be be consistent with what Scripture tells us, John? Why, why don't you tell us about that a little bit, because that's an important consideration. Yes, I, I think that that's the first place we should begin, is is it consistent with Scripture? And uh, on the screen we see a uh, of the back side, uh, th that half of it where the, uh, the back of the man buried in it was laid on, and we see uh, on the, uh, the back of his head, uh, between the two burn lines, the back of his head, and there's, there seems to be blood lines coming out of, of that area. That, that, all those areas that appear to be blood have been tested, and they, they are blood. Uh, and, and we remember that Jesus had a crown of thorns forced down over his head, and you, and you can see some of the results of it there. Uh, if we come down a little bit towards the back, we notice that uh, there are two areas that have been uh, badly rubbed, um, as though he had... Uh, carried something uh, very heavy across his shoulders. And remember that Jesus had to carry his cross at least part of the way to uh, Calvary. Um, as we come down the back, we notice there's, now it doesn't show up real good in this picture, but there's lots of little dumbbell-shaped pop, pop marks that um, coat the back. And remember that Jesus, uh, according to the scriptures, was scourged. It doesn't say how badly it was, but 
the, the scourging on this man was really bad. If we follow the images further down the, the legs, we notice something interesting. If this is a crucifixion victim, and we'll see other uh, um, indications on the front side that it is, um, we don't see the legs are broken anywhere, but we remember that Jesus's legs were not broken. Um, and then finally we come to the feet and we can see blood uh, trickling off of um, the right foot and there's some blood on the left foot too. And um, there's a, a controversy as to how many nails were used. Usually they think of just one nail through the metacarpal portion of the foot. But um, if you drive a nail through the foot, that's another indication that we're dealing with a crucifixion victim and that's what Jesus was. If we can go over to the front side now, we notice that um, once again, on the far right-hand side, there's um, bloodlines coming from the scalp of the man. If we move down a little bit to the face, um, various pathologists believe that they can see um, bruises on his cheeks, especially the right cheek. Um, we move further down and we can see uh, uh, that there's probably scourges uh, that are on the front of the body too. This man was really badly beaten. Um, we can see a triangle shaped uh, uh, watermark in the middle of the chest. And if you look at the bottom of that watermark, it seems to be pointing to a blood mark right next to a patch that was sewn uh, on it. And uh, that blood mark, we believe it was um, uh, coming from a spear wound that was um, thrust in, into a side. It shows the left side, but everything on the front of the shroud is um, anatomically reversed because we turn it over to give it the proper perspective. If we move down a little bit, we can see that the arms are folded uh, in, in, at the loins. Uh, we can see bloodlines coming down the arms as though the man's arms were above his head and nailed that way because we can see what appears to be a very serious wound, not in his palm of his hand, but further back uh, in uh, the uh, wrist where um, uh, there's more substance to hold a body on, on a cross. Uh, if we, as we come down the legs, once again, we can see no indication that this man's legs were, were broken. And um, we finally come to a blood mark there. It appears to be on the left foot. It's really the right, the right foot um, where, uh, where he would have been nailed uh, to the cross. If, if it's Jesus' um, um, body that we're seeing. That's a very uh, good. That's a very good. Now, now our audience can tell that you have thoroughly studied this, and we're going to put these pictures up on the screen for folks to to uh, take a look at. We also want to mention that Mr. Long has published articles for for ABR and Bible and Spade, and on our website that back up the comments that he's making and show more information. And folks, you can go there and and read those items. We encourage you to pick up Bible and Spade as well. And fans, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We'll be right back after this message. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. I'm here with Mr. John Long, and we're exploring the Shroud of Turin. Now, John, uh, you went through some, quite a bit of detail just with the Shroud and correlating it with the crucifixion victim. Uh, one of the things that we've talked about is this is a forensic investigation, this the Shroud, really, because you're going to the past, you're trying to reconstruct it. You have some categories that you would like to talk about uh, you know, uh, not just one piece of evidence, but a matrix of it is a term we use here at ABR. Please uh, begin with that. Yes. Well, um, how is uh, a person, especially a Christian person, uh, to decide whether or not this is really the, uh, the authentic uh, burial shroud of Jesus that the Lord is presenting to his eyes or not? And there's two things that need to be done. One is to consider the facts 
And the other is to, if you're a Christian, let's lift it up to the Lord and walk with him and see where, you, where he leads you and what you get. So let's first off take, take a look at the facts. There are a massive amount of facts for the Shroud. Uh, we couldn't possibly uh, go into depth about even any one particular area. But what we can do is we can summarize them and give a, 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 an idea of why so many people are concluding that the Shroud is probably uh, authentic. Now, I've got uh, 10 categories of evidence. I think all the evidence can be placed in one of 10 categories. And I think you can then make a determination as to which, where the weight is. Is it, is it towards authenticity or is it not towards authenticity? The most important category that I can think of is scripture. Um, well, we've just done that. And we can see that what we see on the shroud matches up fairly well with what the uh, scripture said happened to Jesus during his passion. The second most important category happens to be the, phys the physical and chemical um, properties, analysis of the images. Is the blood really blood? Well, it's been tested. It is blood. And what's causing the body image? Is it a painting or is it some other kind of uh, a strange artistic method? And uh, what, what the uh, scientists who, who looked at the shroud in the late 1970s and early 80s concluded was that the body image on the shroud is described as a dehydrated, oxidized, conjugated carbonyl. That means it's similar to simply uh, yellowed aged linen. And they've spent hundreds of thousands of hours trying to understand it, but there, there is no complete understanding that they've come to so far. Um, there's a medical analysis would be the third category, a very important one. There's been at least 20 um, uh, experts with uh, medical backgrounds, oftentimes pathologists who've looked at it, and they are convinced that it would have probably have taken some kind of a badly beaten, crucified body to have made the images that we see there. There's other historical documentation. How far back can we um, uh, trace the history of the shroud? And the, the best explanation for that is that the shroud was probably folded up so that only the face was showing. And in that uh, format, it was uh, known as the image of Edessa, which goes back at least as far as the 6th century. And when it first appeared in, for certain in the 6th century, it carried, um, it carried uh, traditions that took it all the way back to um, the, um, the 1st century in Jerusalem. Uh, there's art history and analysis. Um, the Shroud seems to have played a big role in uh, the uh, um, development of Christian art. Textile analysis. Um, a number of textile uh, experts have said that it's possible that the Shroud will date back to um, ancient times, and they even see some indications, slight indications that indicate that it's more likely to be an ancient cloth than it is to be um, some kind of a, a medieval, uh, late medieval uh, a product. There's analysis of, believe it or not, the plant pollen and the dirt that's in the shroud. And uh, both of those are consistent with the kind of uh, dirt you would find in um, uh, Jerusalem and the plant pollen that you would find in that area. There's uh, a uh, category that we would call non-body imagery. Uh, flowers, for instance, the faint partial images of many flowers that um, that are to be seen on the shroud, and um, no less a person than the top botanist in, in uh, Israel, a man by the name of Danin, a number of years ago, looked at enhanced pictures around the face of the man in the shroud and said that these were the flowers of Jerusalem. Um, there's other uh, archaeological considerations like burial customs, and um, it, you know, you know, even the the measurements of the shroud is remarkable because it seems to be uh, in in segments of of, of uh, the Assyrian cubit, which was uh, one of the principal uh, measurements in the Jerusalem marketplace, about twenty one point um, uh, seven inches long. And if you measure the shroud by that, then you come out to an even eight cubits by two cubits. The, uh, now, that's nine categories so far, and as I see it, and many others do, the, the, the evidence is weighted. That's not saying that, 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 that uh, there aren't uh, criticisms of that evidence, but the evidence seems to be weighted towards uh, authenticity. There's only one category which on the, ba on, on, um, the, uh, on the face of it appears to be weighted against it, and that was the 1988 radiocarbon dating, which we will, sh we will talk about in just a moment. Okay, that was excellent. I would call that, John, a tour de force. 
of evidence. And again, I just want to mention to the audience, we do have this information on our website and in Bible and Spade magazine that John has written, the history and the background and the sources that help with all this. Now, John, let's just uh, take one minute. I'm going to zero in on uh, just one item here. We'll talk about carbon-14 in the next segment. Just tell us a little more about the pollen. That intrigues me very much. Uh, got about a minute for that. We have um, we had a man by the name of Mac Fry who, in 1973, took some sticky tape removals from the shroud and was able to carefully uh, take off some plant pollens. And then I believe he made something like seven trips between 1973 and at the end of the 1970s uh, to uh, the Middle East to collect fresh pollen. And when he compared these pollens, he said that the, he could find upwards to uh, I think it was something like 56 uh, or so species of plants that um, uh, grow in the Middle East that were in that pollen. And um, in fact, uh, I know one that was called Zygophyllum demosum. It only grows in that area, it only grows around Jerusalem and the Sinai, and maybe in Jordan. And uh, he found pollen from that plant on the shroud. So how did that, how did that get there? And it's a strong indication that the, yes. that flowers were laid on the shroud at some point in the, in the, in the past. That's, that's excellent. And that, honestly, uh, that was one of the evidences that convinced me years ago to take this seriously. And, uh, uh, and that it wasn't a medieval forgery or some, something like that. Well, friends, uh, we've been here with John Lawn talking about the Shroud of Turin. It's exciting. It's a fascinating artifact. And we'll be right back after this message. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm here with Mr. John Long, and we're talking about the Shroud of Turin. All right, John, uh, you gave us a tour de force in that second segment. That was phenomenal. But we want to talk about one, one piece of scientific evidence that seemed to weigh against the shroud being authentic, and that is the carbon-14 date from 1988. we got to deal with that because that's uh, something that skeptics latch on to. Yes, well, there are 10 categories, uh, as I've enumerated, uh, that uh, speak as to the shroud's authenticity, and I believe, and many others do, that there are nine of those uh, are weighted to some degree towards authenticity. The only one that's weighted heavily against authenticity was a radiocarbon dating that was done in 1988. And um, on the screen, we can see three uh, gentlemen who participated in that dating. Um, the gentleman on either end uh, represented the Oxford Laboratory, which was one of the laboratories that received pieces of the shroud to date, as well as control pieces uh, uh, from other cloths, just to make sh uh, dates where they knew what the date was um, so that they could um, uh, make sure that the date that they got for the shroud was was the same. Uh, there was a laboratory in uh, Arizona, and there was a laboratory in Zurich, uh, Switzerland, that participated. And then they were sent their raw results for testing the shroud and testing the control samples. There were, there were three control samples. To the gentleman uh, in the middle, his name is Dr. Michael Tite, and he was in charge of the statisticians of the British Museum for finally working up a, um, a, a, a radiocarbon date. Now, they could tell by the raw data coming into the labs that this was going to come out to be late medieval. However, when the raw data then reached the British Museum and they tried to work it into uh, an acceptable radiocarbon dating, they discovered that the dates uh, that um, they were getting from the three labs for the, for the shroud were so far apart that it wouldn't easily uh, work into the to the carbon dating measurements. There, there, or I should say, their their uh, um, 
their their final uh, report. Uh, they were just too scattered. They were too over too broad an area. Now um, they, I think they, what they did is they manipulated the results a little bit to make it look not so bad, and they finally published their result on, on as you can see, on the figure behind um, Dr. Uh, uh, Tite between 1260 and 1390. And of course, this caused a lot of consternation among uh, many syndenologists, as you might imagine, uh, who believe that the previous evidence was pointed towards authenticity, but now this comes along and points elsewhere. So um, what should happen? Now, there were a lot, lot of uh, different uh, theories as to what went wrong, if anything went wrong. But we could see that something must have went, went wrong when they couldn't get the dates for the shroud to to mesh into an acceptable radiocarbon date. Um, it turns out that a, a Christian couple, uh, Sue ben, uh, Benford and um, Joe Marino, uh, were working on this problem. They were lay people, but they were very knowledgeable about the shroud. When Sue Benford, in her spiritual meditations, heard a voice that said, it's a reweave, it's a reweave. And what happened was they submitted uh, a picture of that an area that had been carbon dated um, uh, to three textile experts without telling them where it came from. And each of those text, textile experts said that that portion had been rewoven, that they could see so much difference from one side to the other that what the carbon dated dating uh, laboratories had done is they had dated a rewoven area. In other words, they had a... Um, a portion of, of the shroud that was probably tank, uh, loose and needed to be mended, and it, uh, more recent uh, linen were, were very carefully and skillfully rewoven into it. And so what was dated was not only the original shroud, but also this um, uh, rewoven material. And they presented their uh, a paper in, in, in the year, uh, what was it, um, uh, 2000. And um, one scientist who did disagreed with it, who had actually worked on the shroud, he, um, when he tested their results, because he had actually um, portions of the cloth near that area, he discovered that, th that what they did was correct, that you can see portions that are in that cloth that um, are not representative of the um, main part of the uh, of, of the shroud. It has chemicals in it that are not there in the uh, uh, main portion of the shroud. Right. It um, right. it looks like a repair. Yeah, and that this is important. This is what you would consider like in archaeology contamination. It, it, and it's throwing off the date. Well, thank you for being so detailed with that. Well, John, believe it or not, we're, we're already coming down to the end. You've only given a tip of the tip of the iceberg. But I'd like you to take the last minute, minute and a half here or so to just to sort of give your final reflections on the shroud, all these years you've been studying it. And then, of course, what's, what's most important about the story behind the shroud, if it's indeed authentic. Um. What is the shroud? I, I believe that the shroud is a picture postcard that God has preserved and sent down through through the centuries. And um, it, it's an invitation. It's an invitation for us to go back in time, first with our eyes, but then more importantly, with our minds and hearts, to be present at the most important moment that there ever was. When Jesus finishes paying for our sins, and you can see that in the blood and gore that he suffered that's there on the cloth, but also his victorious resurrection. And that, I think, is very quietly hinted at in the uh, unusual uh, properties of the um, body and blood images that are on the cloth. The Lord is showing us um, what he did for us and giving us an invitation to trust him. Well, John, thank you so much. All your years of research, your relationship with ABR goes back many years. Uh, the articles you've written, as we've mentioned on, uh, in Bible and Spade and on the website, we're very grateful uh, for you coming on the show and for you sharing your knowledge of the subject. Thank you so much, Henry. God bless. God bless you, John. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Resurrection Day. That's exactly right. And friends, uh, you know, we're, we're weighing the evidence of the Shroud of Turin. We want to we wanna be honest seekers of truth. If an artifact points in this direction that it's actually the burial shroud of Jesus, then we ought to allow the evidence to lead us there. But regardless if you ultimately decide that, we know from the New Testament that the certainty of the resurrection is recorded by the apostles 
and those who witnessed the resurrected Jesus. And in this, we can stand with certainty. Is the Shroud of Turin Jesus' burial shroud? Well, if it is, it speaks to his resurrection. If it's not, his resurrection stands anyway. And that's what you can trust in for eternal life. Thank you for watching Digging for Truth.